today. We're going to be talking about how you use your speak up data to inform your planning process. And so what we're going to do is take kind of a mini version of a workshop that I've been conducting for uh, school districts and schools around the country on how to effectively leverage your feedback data from your participants to be able to inform your digital learning plan. So this is our uh, leadership seminar. It is our uh, kind of mini version of the much larger workshop. But I'll talk to you about as we go through what uh, is also covered in that workshop in case you're potentially interested in that. And I think that if we haven't, if, if you wouldn't mind, if you haven't already uh, muted your microphone, that would be helpful. There'll be plenty of time for us to chat at the end, but I wanna make sure that that everybody can hear what we're saying today. So thank you so very much. Okay, so to get started, we're gonna do a little bit of a refresher, um, just a little tiny quick Speak Up 101, make sure we're all on the same page. And that gives me an opportunity to reinforce a couple key components of the way that we have sped, set up the Speak Up Research Project, because that obviously leads into the analysis. And then we'll take a look at what some of the key trends are that we're paying attention to. They might be the same ones that you're paying attention to also, or maybe there's some new ideas there. And then we'll start diving into the data. We're going to use the Speak Up data as our model today, but quite honestly, the process that I'm going to be sharing with you actually works for most kinds of feedback data that you might get from your stakeholders as, as well. And so we'll go through that data to information equals knowledge process so that you have a concrete way to look at your speak up data and hopefully use it for your planning purposes. And then I'm asked this all the time, so I included it in this year's seminar. If you only have 20 minutes to look at your speak up data, what are the most important questions that you should be paying attention to? Now, of course, that's very hard to do because everyone's situation might be different but I was able to go through and pick out the ones that I think for most people are um, pretty common as the types of questions that you should be paying attention to. So uh, we'll take a look at that. Then we're going to talk about some other ways that Project Tomorrow can support your efforts, some other ideas that we have, some other resources that we have, and then we'll leave time for your questions, your comments, your thoughts, your insights. That's always my favorite part. We're going to start off with using the chat box for questions. So if you have a question that comes up as I'm talking, feel free to jump in to the chat box. I know what it's like when you have that question. Uh, jump in there. I'll try and keep an eye on that. Maybe we can answer it right away. Otherwise, at the end, we can open up the microphones and um, have a conversation. And then, of course, I'll give you some additional insights in terms of planning for next year's Speak Up as well. All right, just so that everyone knows, and I think you probably do, but Project Tomorrow is an education nonprofit group. We've been involved with supporting K-12 education since 1996. And our focus is 100% on the idea that today's students should be well prepared for their future. Uh, we have a bias. We believe in the power of STEAM resources, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, to really support and drive that preparation process for today's students. And we're probably best well known, as most of you do, uh, because of the Speak Up Research Project on Digital Learning, which increasingly is focused in on making sure that it isn't just about collecting data, but really about supporting leadership in our schools and districts about the effective use of stakeholder viewpoints to support their digital learning planning. So you know that we have been doing this research project since 2003 and it's 100% facilitated through schools and districts. We create for you a suite of online surveys and then make those available to any K-12 school or district that would like to use them to collect feedback from your own stakeholders. We give you back all of your summary data, of course, as well as either state or national data for benchmarks, or in the case of our friends that are here from the Archdiocese of Newark, we also do affinity um, data collection around Catholic schools around the country and can give you that comparative as well. So we manage the entire process and it is a 100% free process, free service for our schools and districts. We have some wonderful partners that we 
work with all around the country. We're very proud of those relationships. Many of you may be members of these different organizations or follow them as well. So let's get into the talking about the questions that are on the Speak Up survey because that'll start driving the way that we look at the analysis and how I would like to be able to share that with you. So we have a set of what we call standard survey questions. These are the types of questions that you can basically count on will be on the Speak Up surveys year after year. They focus in on the use of technology to support teaching and learning. So we do ask different questions of different audiences. So we ask teachers every year about what is on their wish list for professional learning. We ask uh, leaders about what's waking you up in the middle of the night as a statement of your priorities and maybe some of your challenges. We ask students about their interest in different types of careers and how they want to explore those careers. But for the main part, we have a series of questions that are similar across all the different audiences. And that then gives the opportunity to do some comparatives between the different audiences. Those tend to focus in on the emerging trends using technology, whether that is digital content, the use of mobile devices, different types of classroom models, and of course, we're always focused in on what the aspirations are for that ultimate school. Now each year we also have new questions that we add to the Speak Up surveys that tend to be uh, topical or timely or thematic in their approach. And so some of you are probably already familiar with, with what were some of the new question themes that we added for the 2018-19 school year. And here's the rundown of what some of those were. We asked some new questions about social emotional learning as well as school safety. We added to the questions we've already been asking around computer programming and STEAM. We've always been asking students about their online behaviors, particularly inappropriate behaviors, let's call them that. And we asked some additional new questions about that. We also asked a really interesting set of questions around students' experiences with YouTube. Uh, whether they were using YouTube as a learning modality, which we think is really interesting. And then also a set of new questions about teachers' referrals of digital content. So were teachers referring digital content solutions to their colleagues? How often do they do that? And do they also take those referrals and act upon them? And what type of referrals are more meaningful than others? I'm doing a lot of additional analysis on that data right now, really thinking about how we are going to message that out nationwide because it is really very provocative. But those were the thematic questions that we had for this year. Some of those will get incorporated into a continuation for the following year. Others will be replaced by other themes. The key thing for you to know with the way we set up the questions, the process that we go through in terms of identifying questions for the Speak Up surveys is that we do it within the, this context. We look at it across what we call three vectors, activities, attitudes, and aspirations. So all of the questions on the different surveys for the different audiences could be an activity question, it could be an attitude question, it could be an aspirational question. Now by activities, what we mean is what are the different stakeholders doing using technology? So some sample questions around activities are, for example, we ask students, how are you using mobile devices for learning? We ask teachers, how often are you using videos in your classroom? We ask parents, what is your home internet status? Those are activity-oriented questions. They answer questions that can be counted, is the way I usually think about it. Um, most surveys that are out there or have been out there about technology tend to focus in on the activities almost exclusively. From the very beginning with Speak Up, though, we realized that this was a complicated and more sophisticated ecosystem than just to look at activities. And so for that reason, we also include on the surveys questions that have to do with stakeholder attitudes as well as aspirations. So attitudes have to do with valuation. So we ask questions, what are the benefits of digital learning for you? For teachers, what determines quality in the digital content that you, 
that you are using in the classroom. And we ask parents about their concerns about their child's technology use. These get to people's feelings about things. And then aspirations is more the wish list. So what type of technology is essential for your dream school? What's on your wish list for professional development? What do you think is the best way for your students or your child to learn college and career ready skills? We believe very strongly that it is in the triangulation of activities, attitudes, and aspirations that we get a very clear or more comprehensive picture of what the views are of your stakeholders. If we only asked people what they were doing, we really wouldn't understand if they valued those experiences or not, or if those experiences were meeting their future needs. So by looking at the data across these three vectors, activities, attitudes, and aspirations, we believe that's how you get to the better decision making using your data. Now again, that's one of the things that makes the Speak Up process unique because we very consciously look at it from a standpoint of how are you going to use the data? How do we make it as impactful and valuable to you as possible? So what we hear from schools and districts across the country is that there are basically five ways that they are leveraging their Speak Up data to create what we call actionable knowledge. So that's taking the data as it sits and creating the opportunity for it to inform or validate or instigate, shall we say, some new initiatives within your schools and districts. So these five ways are that many districts tell us that they use their Speak Up data as part of their teacher's professional development to either understand what their teachers want and need from professional development or as content for the professional development experiences that their teachers are having. I'm always impressed when districts tell me that they use their data to inform their community engagement outreach. That might be engaging parents, it might be engaging their greater community, it could be engaging other stakeholders or partners, and being able to use that data as almost a bridge between what's happening in their school world with what's happening in the community. Many districts tell us that they use their Speak Up data for decision making. And that decision making might be around evaluating outcomes. So they may have uh, implemented a new initiative. Maybe it's blended learning classrooms. Maybe it's mobile devices in the classrooms. Uh, maybe it's online professional development for their teachers. And they want to understand if it is meeting the mark and achieving the outcomes that they desired. And so in many ways, their speak up data can help them do that. Other districts tell us that before they implement a new initiative, they use their speak up data to understand where their community is. Are they ready for this new initiative? Are they ready to um, invest in this new initiative? And that, of course, takes us to the fifth one that districts tell us, school and districts tell us that they're using their speak up data for. And quite often that's for funding development. That might be that they are using their speak up data as part of a grant application. We know that many districts around the country are, are preparing their EIR grant applications for the US Department of Education. And they're using their speak up data to validate or to substantiate why they need this particular grant. They do that also with local grants as well. In addition to that, over the past 15 years, it has been amazing to me how uh, successfully many schools and districts have been to raise additional funds to support their technology investments by using their speak up data, either to help pass bond measures or parcel tax or some other levy on, um, uh, to support their schools. Now we know that the key idea with Speak Up is to be able to give you good, solid data that can inform your new discussions. And for many of us, it's about seeing the world through new eyes. So if you have seen any of my presentations in the past, you will be familiar with this image because I use it quite often. Uh, some of us here today might see a woman that looks like she has a long skirt in this image and she's swishing through leaves, maybe it's fall time. Others might see the image of a face, deep set eyes, very high forehead. 
I like to talk about the fact that for so many of our different stakeholders today, be they students, our parents, our teachers, our administrators, our community at large, we may all look at this image and see different things. And it's the same with the use of technology today. We are seeing things through our own experiential lens. And those lenses are different because of the way that technology has been adopted and adapted in our, in our personal lives as well as our school lives. So our goal is to be able to help you use your speak up data to improve our site, maybe to give you some new lenses to use to explore uh, what the views are of your stakeholders. So now what I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to share with you the trends that we're watching. And then we're going to get a little bit into the data with some of those trends so that you can start to see how we analyze data. My goal today is to be able to leave you with some tools, some tricks, some techniques, some strategies for better leveraging the speak up data that you have. So here's the big trends or a summary of some of the big trends that we're looking at that we're paying a lot of attention to. Obviously, there's lots of interest in understanding how to best prepare students for the world, whether that is with the development of college or career ready skills or what a lot of people are talking about increasingly is citizen ready skills. And so a lot of new emphasis on how do we leverage technology effectively to do that. Part of that is coming from this increased interest that we see all over in new learning models. Um, and that might include, again, mobile devices, blended learning, project-based learning, competency-based learning, all of these different new instructional models that are being explored. We're increasingly seeing not only greater interest, but much more implementation of those different learning models than we saw before as well. We also know that for today's students, learning is a 24-7 enterprise. Uh, it does not start and stop the moment they walk in and walk out of our schools. But in fact, because of their access to technology, whether that is on a, um, a mobile device or uh, through the internet or using some different types of apps, that students' uh, learning is continuing outside of school and it is self-directed. In many ways, the experiences that they're having outside of school is actually starting to influence their expectations for the use of technology within their school environment. We think that's particularly interesting. We also know that for many different organizations, um, different schools and districts, there is increased interest in understanding what the tangible outcomes are from the investments that have been made in technology. You know, for a long time, and obviously we've been doing this for a long time, but for a long time, the idea of being able to say that the outcome of the investments that we made was that the students were more engaged in learning. Now, engagement is obviously a very important factor in the learning process. But for many school board members who I talk to, they are looking for something more tangible, more concrete than shiny eyes and smiley faces. They are looking for outcomes that substantiate the, in the value of the technology and the investment that they've made. And so that thinking beyond engagement is a really important conversation. We also know the importance of internet connectivity, both at school and at home. And also the fact that we are increasingly seeing connections in our data, and many of you may have seen the report that we put out in June about this, that uh, the effectiveness of the leadership at the school influences the effectiveness of the digital learning experiences that students are having. Now I want to go back to one that I skipped here because I want to use that as sort of the basis for the rest of our, our next conversation about the data. And this is this, um, trend that we've been watching for a while about the new digital parent. Um, within our data, the analysis that we do, we have always looked at the age of the parent and the age of the child of the parent and looked at that data individually to see if there was any new emerging trends that were coming out of it. After, after the last couple of years, over the last couple of years, we have definitely seen this emergence of what we're calling the new digital parent who tends to be younger. Their children are in elementary school at this point and they are characterized by having higher expectations 
around the use of technology in their child's life in school and also different aspirations for how they want to be communicated with from their child's school and their child's school district. Now, in many ways, they, that profile is dramatically different than parents who are older who maybe did not grow up using technology or are not, uh, have not had the experiences of using it at work or as part of their learning lives. And so we think that's a particularly interesting trend. We also have seen over the last couple of years, increasingly schools and districts are using a wide range of different types of communication vehicles to share information with the parents of their students. And so some of those are social media tools increasingly. There's still some use of traditional tools, um, school websites, um, email. Printed newsletters are in some areas still going home, but there is definitely a wide range of different types of tools and lots of interests that school and district leaders have in understanding what are the most effective tools for them to use. Now here's where our analysis of the speak up data can help with this. So we're going to walk through a little bit of a scenario of the analysis and then talk about some actions that come out of these specific data points. Now again, I'm using the national data here today. Of course, as they say, your mileage may differ. And so your data statistics may be different from your parents or from your um, school administrators. But here we start off with um, a little bit of data around crisis or alert communications. And in fact, 44% of parents nationwide told us they were very satisfied. An additional 28% said they checked the box that said satisfied. This is one of those statistics that is kind of half full, half empty glass situation. Some folks look at this and say, wow, 44% of parents say they're very satisfied. I think that's great. Others look at it and say, I want a much higher level of parents that are very satisfied than 44%. Now we also asked administrators, so uh, of the social media tools, which ones do you think are most effective for communicating crisis or alert information to parents? And uh, you see here about a third of school administrators told us that they thought that Facebook and quit Twitter were effective tools for crisis and alert communication specifically. You may remember that we actually poll for both parents and administrators, not just on crisis alert information, but also on general information coming from the school or district and also teacher provided information. Now the parents are not as bullish on these tools as the administrators are, a lesser degree, small lesser degree of parents say they think they're effective for crisis alert information. And sometimes this baffles school administrators because they say, well, my parents appear to be on Facebook all the time. How is it that they don't look at that as being an effective tool for communications. And this gets to this idea of triangulating some of the data. We need to be thinking not just about what parents say they do, but what do they value? Where are their aspirations? And that's where this next bit of data can be very helpful. So we ask parents, what are your preferences for the most effective crisis alert communications vehicles? And we see here that the number one that parents said, almost three quarters of parents said, they really value those auto phone messages that come into their home or into their own cell phone. They also like the opportunity where something is text messaged to them, to their device, or pushed out through a school or district mobile app. They like the idea of that mobile app from an update standpoint as well. And then you see where Facebook and Twitter fits in. So there's a couple things that are happening here in the analysis of this data. We're, I'm hoping that you're starting to see how we're triangulating and looking at social media use and attitudes and aspirations to get that fuller picture. So then some of the actions that can be driven by this translation of the speak up data might be along these lines. Um, we increasingly over the last couple of years, and particularly with these new digital parents who are younger, see that parents want information pushed to them rather than having to look it up themselves. Parents are much more excited about the idea of a text message, even about general communications, than having to go to your school or district website to look up information. 
But we know that no single tool or communications vehicle is going to fit all parents. And so it's important from a school or district leadership standpoint to not put all of your chips down, shall we say, on only one modality, but rather to be thinking about all the different ways that we can support uh, school to home communications. We definitely saw that mobile app features are becoming increasingly valued. And also this idea that just because parents say they're using social media in their personal life, we should not jump to the conclusion that those are the best ways to communicate with parents. And then again, we also see that sometimes our administrators have a different perspective than the parents do. So we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at our speak up data as well. Okay, so that was a little bit of sort of putting the toe in the water folks in terms of that triangulation of the data, looking at activities, aspirations and attitudes and seeing how we can pull specific bits of the speak up data together to be able to look at what some actions are that can be derivative from this. So what we're gonna do next is do that again, get a little bit more deeply into this. But a couple key points that I wanna bring up to you. I know that with the speak up process, and if you participate, and I'm looking at your numbers here, uh, many of you had students participate, you had teachers participate, you had parents participate. I am fully aware of the fact that it can become a little overwhelming with all of that data and all of those questions. So the process that we're gonna take you through, the data to information equals knowledge process, is set up with the idea that you are gonna look at your speak up data within a goal orientation in smaller bites. So it's not so overwhelming, but it re really lends itself to creating some new knowledge and being able to use that for your immediate work and plans. So, Let's dive into some data here. So what types of data do um, education leaders typically use? Well, this is all data that I'm sure you have access to or you have used from different times. It includes um, assessment data, it includes observation data, attendance data is used by lots of folks, obviously, disciplinary data. The key thing here to understand is that Speak Up sits in a particular spot where it is exclusively feedback data. This is the type of data that I'm sure you've been collecting anyway from your students, your parents, your staff, your community. It gets to that idea of what are you doing, what do you like, what do you want, what do you need. So it's different than attendance data, it's different than assessment data, and thus it needs to be treated differently. I strongly believe that feedback data from stakeholders can be a tremendous asset that you can utilize to be able to inform your planning and your programs and your initiatives going forward. But again, it needs to be treated in a particular way. So there are pros and cons of using feedback data to inform your planning. We'll take a look at the pros first. Uh, it obviously gives you different perspectives, particularly if you are polling different audiences as you can do through the speak up process. So you can get the point of view of parents, you can get the point of view of your teachers, point of view of the community members of students. It also can create an opportunity for you to get very authentic feedback, particularly if you are polling beyond, um, you know, just a spot conversation here or there or a student that's on your advisory council or a parent that sits on a parent council for you. Being able to have a broader set of perspectives can really lend itself to creating a, an environment where you have good authentic feedback from your different stakeholder groups. It can also be a tool for engagement in terms of bringing the voices of your different stakeholders to to bear. And of course, in that process, it demonstrates a commitment that you have to listening to respecting the views of your different stakeholders. And there's other pros as well. In terms of the cons, sometimes too many perspectives can simply be too many perspectives. And so it's hard to then be able to see where the value is if you have all these competing voices. Uh, feedback data needs interpretation. By itself, it sits kind of flat is the way I think about it. You need to be able to understand what it means and how to use it effectively. 
In some cases, folks feel that another con of feedback data is that it warrants a response. So it sets up an expectation that you need to respond. I will tell you right up front that I am always impressed with schools and districts around the country. Many of you may already be doing this that not only are participating in Speak Up to collect the data to inform your own programs and plans, but also to be able to share at least part of it out with your community. And so to keep it as part of an ongoing dialogue. I always recommend to folks that they, um, before they start in with Speak Up, they think about how to leverage this tool for community engagement, for uh, transparency with your community as well. So there's many different pros and cons associated with feedback data, but again, the value can really exceed any sort of negatives if used effectively. And so what we're gonna do is hopefully get you in an environment where you can go from this, you all know is the scream, to something that is more calm and serene like this when you are using data. So we're gonna help you create actionable knowledge using this data to information equals knowledge process. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through the methodology. It's a methodology that we use internally in terms of looking at the speak up data. It's what we use to create the findings and the reports and all the information that we use, uh, that we create. But most importantly, I wanna share this with you so that you have an opportunity to leverage these tools in the same way. Now remember, I said at the beginning that this is what we're doing here today is our online seminar. It's kind of a mini version of a three hour workshop that I do with districts and schools where we actually look at your own local data. So the data I'm gonna use here for our little seminar is national data. Uh, but please know, obviously, you can apply this same processes to your own data, or if you want us to help, we can help with that also. So as the title implies, data to information equals knowledge, we look at it across three different buckets. There's data, there's information, and there's knowledge. And those are not necessarily the same things. Data is what you have collected through Speak Up. So you have a number of stakeholders that completed different surveys. You can look at your Speak Up data. You can see how many people responded to question five and how many people within question five chose this first option versus the second option versus this third option. That's data. We need to translate that data into information, and we're gonna go through that process in a moment, and then use that information to align it with your goals and create new knowledge or insights that are actionable, participatory, they're organized in a way that makes sense, and they're strategic to address those particular goals that you have. It's all in the service of helping you make better decisions or make better plans or have new insights to inform your work. So let's jump into this. I have a little scenario that I've put together uh, using teacher data, uh, again, using the national teacher data and a little bit of comparative data. But again, it, it, this can equally apply to your data from students, from administrators, from community members, from parents. So the first step in working through this process is to think about your goals. So those are the goals that were driving the interest that you had in participating in Speak Up. So why did you wanna collect data from your teachers? Why did you wanna collect data from your students? or from your parents or whoever the audience was. So to help us along in this process, I create a little fictitious district scenario. It could be a district, it could be a school. So it's a little fictitious scenario, though it may resonate with some of you. So we're gonna say that the goals in this little scenario is that this particular school district wanted to implement a one-to-one -one mobile device program in all of their schools. And they knew based on experience that for the program to be successful, their teachers needed to warm up to the idea, they need to be receptive to the idea of using mobile devices in the classroom, and they needed to be comfortable with the how to use those devices within instruction. They therefore then, their reason for participating in Speak Up was they wanted to understand where their teachers were from a readiness standpoint to accept or to successfully implement this one-to-one -one mobile device program. 
So again, we could overlay this in different types of initiatives or there might be different goals. This is the one we're gonna to use today. So the next step in the process is to identify the right data to use to answer that question about teacher readiness. Now again, there's lots of questions on the Speak Up surveys. So choosing the right ones that match up to those goals is what the second step is about. So in fact, there's a really interesting question. It's one of our standard questions. It's not an every other year question, but it's asked every year on the teacher survey. It's question 17 this year. What do you need to more efficiently and effectively integrate digital content tools and resources into daily instruction? This is a great question for understanding where your what your teachers need and also where they are in their adoption adaptation process. So here's the national data. So nationwide this past year 61% of teachers told us it was about planning time. Quite simply, they need more planning time to be able to work with their colleagues to understand how to use the technology successfully within their grade level within their subject area. 50% said they need more professional development. 49% said it's about mobile devices in the classroom that they don't have access to. A similar number said it was about just-in-time tech support. And 46% indicated that having that reliable, high-quality internet connectivity in their classroom was what they needed at this point. Now that national data is interesting. But what's even more interesting is when we can compare it to either your local data or state level data. So I took just some comparative data here. And again, this is a question that we see varies a lot by schools and districts and states. And it makes sense. It depends upon where you have put your emphasis over the last couple of years. So in this comparative state or district data, we actually see that a higher number of teachers were interested in planning time, but a more significantly 13 percentage point difference from the national data in terms of the teachers wanting or needing mobile devices in their classroom. So in this particular case, it probably falls in line with what the goal is from this district who was just starting to implement one-to-one -one devices school-wide or district-wide. So we can start looking at this comparative data and that's another asset that you have. You can look at your local data, but then you can also look at the comparative data. If you are functioning under a district, you can look at your district aggregated data as well as side by side school data. And you have the experience, the experiential knowledge of what has been happening in those individual schools to understand why some of these statistics may be higher at some schools and lower at others. Maybe that has to do with the professional development that's been done at those schools. Maybe it has to do with the leadership of the principals. Maybe it has to do with the investments that have been made. So it starts the window of us thinking about different ways to interpret this data. But additionally, we don't wanna necessarily base decisions just on one question because we like this idea, remember, of triangulating data, activities, attitudes, and aspirations to get that clearer picture. So we have to start thinking about what are some other questions that can help us interpret this data. So I chose three here for this example. Three additional questions, again from the teacher survey. I'm using the teacher one as my model here. And the first one is question eight. Uh, we asked teachers about the access their students have to mobile devices in their classroom right now, obviously an activity question. We ask about teachers' interest in professional development, what's on their wish list. That's an aspirational question, it's question 22. And then also about their attitudes. And for that, we have a question where we ask teachers about their level of comfort with new instructional models or different types of learning experiences for their students, it's question seven. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at these three additional questions and then start to triangulate that data together. So in terms of teachers reporting on access to mobile devices in the classroom, this is the national data that's here. This is important because this tells you whether or not your teachers have had exposure to using mobile devices in their classroom. So here we see, for example, 
that 15% of the teachers nationwide tell us that their students have no regular access to mobile devices to use in class. And an additional 24% say that they can occasionally schedule and check out devices for classroom usage. So it's a much different environment as we know in the classroom if teachers have if the students in the class have devices that they can use anytime, spontane spontaneously, when a question comes up, then if it needs to be something that needs to be checked out or if the students don't have regular access. So this is an important question for understanding the landscape of the types of exposure that your teachers have had based on their own reporting. Another key question to get you to that readiness is teachers' interest in professional development. Now, again, the goal for this fictitious district was around mobile devices. So we look just specifically at the teacher interest in PD around mobile device usage. So we see here nationwide, 29% of teachers said they're interested in learning better how to uh, integrate mobile devices within instruction and how to identify and use mobile apps. This question asks about all different types of PD. So you can use the same question to address multiple different goals. We know that teachers' interest in PD around a particular type of technology or digital learning environment is an indication of their readiness to learn more and possibly stepping in the direction of greater interest in implementation. And then the third question was that question I mentioned, that's an attitude question, about using mobile devices in the classroom. How comfortable are teachers doing that? So it's interesting to us that nationwide, only one fifth of teachers tell us that they're very comfortable integrating mobile devices within their lessons. Uh, and an additional 35% say they're somewhat comfortable, 57% say they're not sure or not comfortable. We ask this question also about project-based learning, about differentiated instruction, personalized learning, competency-based learning a wide range of different types of different modalities. So this is a great question for understanding very directly where your teachers are on that spectrum of comfort. So now we have the right data. We know what teachers say they need. We understand what their current environment looks like. We understand their comfort level and we understand as an indicator their interest in professional development. And again, you don't have to use just your own local data. You also can use um, your school or district level data, affinity group data, the state level data, national data as well. So we create then information statements from this data. So for example, whatever it might be, school, district, state. Teachers have stronger interest in PD for mobile learning than teachers across the country. That's interesting. Teachers need additional support to build up their comfort with using these devices because their percentage was possibly lower than even the national number. That's the type of way that we do the information statements. And then again, we go right back to those goals in terms of, for this fictitious example, implementing a mobile device program to see how we align these new data that we have, these information statements that we have to the goals. And then that helps us create the knowledge. So here's the way we looked at action steps that could come from this little fictitious example that we did around implementing a one-to-one -one mobile device program in a school or district using the teacher data to understand the readiness of the teachers. So in this example, and I use the national data, our teachers have less access possibly and less exposure to mobile device usage in the classroom than their peers nationwide. So the action could be to increase the availability of these devices for teacher usage prior to the implementation of a one-to-one -one program in the hands of all the kids. If the teachers have had less access or less exposure, it's going to take them a little bit longer to start feeling comfortable utilizing these devices. And so giving them the opportunity to use the devices in advance of handing, handing them to the students would be a way to speed up, for example, that adoption process. In terms of teacher interest in PD around mobile learning, um, 
we know, as I said before, interest in PD is a good sign of readiness. So the process here would be to think about what types of PD is most important to support teachers' existing interest and to make sure that we're using appropriate methodologies for that PD. So it might behoove us to poll our teachers about appropriate methodologies or what specifically within the use of mobile devices they were interested in learning. And then around this idea of teacher comfort, it's really important when planning either PD or support resources to understand where teachers are currently today. So using this question, we can get a really good snapshot as to where teachers are in their comfort spectrum. And then we can start identifying specific ways to help teachers build up those comfort levels, build up their competencies, build up their capacities. In that case, maybe exploring a mentoring program or an online PLC to be able to help teachers with that. So I hope you get sort of the general idea of how we went from data translating that into information, looking at specific bits of data, and then aligning that from a knowledge standpoint to the goals of whatever our particular initiatives are, and be able to then come out of that with some action items that we can um, implement. The idea, again, is to help you through the process of deciphering, translating, whatever you want to call it, the data so that it is of the greatest impact for you. Now, I'm hoping that this little vignette, and again, this is just a small sampling of this, can help you in terms of applying the same methodology with your own speak up data. I'm going to give you a little bit of homework here in a moment. If that is not comfortable for you and you would like to contract with us to help you do that, we can do that with you as well. Okay, I mentioned early on that people often will say to me, okay, I've got, sometimes people say I've got five minutes, I have 10, I have 15, I have 20. How do I, uh, how do I look at all of this, uh, how do I look at all of this data and figure out what are the most important questions? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through, I looked at students, teachers, and parents and identified questions that I think would be of high impact for you if you have a limited amount of time or as a starting point going forward. But let me give you sort of the, uh, sort of the tips of the road here before you get started with this. It is very important to pay attention to your goals. There's a lot of data that is collected through Speak Up, some of which probably directly ties to your goals. And there may be other things that are just kind of interesting, but they're not on your plate right now. So for example, we are working with some schools that are very invested in blended learning. So any of the data that we have about blended learning is high impact for them. But your schools and districts may not be interested in blended learning right now, and so that data may be of less importance. So think about what your goals are. Think about where there are specific types of speak up questions and data that directly apply to what your needs are. And again, I'll use that phrase, your mileage may differ. Uh, that's why I always think it's important to pay attention to the comparative data, whether that is your school by school data or potentially your school versus the state or versus the national data. That sometimes can be very insightful to understand outside of a vacuum where your stakeholders are on their, on their uh, valuations or what they're doing. Now, a uh, big caveat here. There's no silver bullet here, folks. The data will inform, but it will not lead. <laughs> uh, so it's not going to pop off the page at you and say, go and do this. Uh, rather, that is for your interpretation. Um, I am a huge believer in uh, making sure that decision making is local. Uh, local to a school, local to a district, local to a community. And so you can't have someone else come in from on high and say, well, everybody should be doing X, Y, and Z. You need to look at your own community needs, your own stakeholders needs, and the data can help you do that. I also want you to make sure that you're looking at your participation numbers as well. Um, having just a handful of parents complete the survey or a handful of students isn't really any better than having the conversation um, after the parent support meeting or at back to school night. You really want to look at your participation numbers and see where you have numbers that are going to substantiate uh, all the different diversity that's possibly in your school or district. And again, we're here to help you with all of this. 
So let's get into this. Um, you already know the five ways to use the data. So be thinking about that while we go through the questions. So the first one I looked at was middle school and high school students. These are the actual question numbers. And of course, uh, Pilar is gonna send out to you the, this PowerPoint after our uh, time together today. So you don't need to write these down. You're gonna get all of this. But these are the questions that I think if you have a limited amount of time, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to these questions for different reasons. Question six, ask your students about the obstacles they face using technology at school. School leaders are always surprised by the answers that students have about obstacles, because in many cases, that gets to the reality of what's happening in their classroom, not necessarily what is being espoused as a school-wide uh, technology use. Uh, asking students if you're involved with mobile devices, asking students how they're using those mobile devices for learning. In some cases, folks in putting together their mobile learning program had some outcomes that they wanted to see from that use of mobile devices, but that quest, this question can validate that for you or it can lead you in some new directions in terms of how they're actually being used. We have two school climate related questions that are on the Speak Up survey. One is question nine and one is question 23. Question nine asks students about a variety of different environments within their school and whether they agree that those are important to them or true for them. 23 does the same thing having to do with outside of school. So both of those questions give you deeper perspectives on the students themselves and on their belief sets. We ask all the respondents to talk to us about what their vision is for the ultimate school. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that data here in just a moment. But that's an important aspirational question to take a look at. A similar attitude question is the value of technology use for learning. And so understanding from students, we have a similar question for parents and for teachers. What do they see as the outcomes? What do they see as the benefits? Is a good way also to assess either what your current environment looks like or to understand where there are areas that you should maybe address. I think that one of the most important questions you can take a look at today is question 21, and that's how your students are using technology outside of school for learning. I mentioned a trend that we're watching is around the idea of what students are doing outside of school for learning, using technology can influence their expectations inside of your classrooms. And so that's a good question to take a look at. Question 25 is about online behaviors, the types of things that students are experiencing. In many cases, these are the not so nice, uh, unsafe behaviors, but having a good handle on understanding that's important for school and district leaders today. And then another question that we've been asking just the last couple of years, but has become institutionalized on the surveys, is where we ask students if they believe that the teachers and administrators at their school are interested in listening to their ideas about how to improve school. It's a really great student agency question, and it's a question that we should all be paying more attention to. So those are the student questions I would recommend. From parents, I have a similar list of about nine questions. And again, some of these may apply more than others to you. The first three work in tandem with one another. They're questions four, five, and six. Um, and it's really interesting because they are an activity question, an attitude question, and an aspirational question right there, sort of a nice microcosm. Question four is we ask parents, what worries you about your child's future? Question five, what workplace skills are most important for your child to develop within their learning environments? And then question six is, what do you think are the best ways for your child to develop these types of workplace skills? We ask parents in question eight, how important is technology use in school? The prioritization of that is really valuable with understanding in general how supportive your school community is about technology use. I think that question is a particularly more valuable question today than it has been the last couple of years because there is so much concern today about students getting too much screen time in school. And so understanding where your school community is on that spectrum is important. We do ask parents about their concerns about technology use at school as well, that's question nine, as well as question 27 is about their concerns about students' online behavior. And that is where we poll parents about that concern point on too much screen time. 
We ask parents about their value that they place on technology use in school for their child, their vision for the ultimate school, and then also, as I used in my first example, the efficacy around various types of communication tools for different modalities. And then finally, the teacher's questions, and this one's a little bit longer. I, I, I pulled 10 for you. Again, some may apply more than others, are also important to take a look at. The first two are companion questions, five and six. Use of technology in class to support student learning and use of technology to support the teacher's professional tasks. That gives you both sides of the apple, shall we say. Question seven is that question I used before about comfort with new instructional models. And then we also ask teachers, as we do with parents, how important is technology use in preparing today's students for the future? Question 11 is based on Marzano. Uh, so it takes a look at what the instructional goals are driving technology usage, and it could be easily mapped onto the Marzano pyramid, if that's what you wanted to do. We ask teachers, what do you need to use technology more effectively? Remember, I used that in our example earlier. And then here, question 18 is what the teachers say is their vision for the ultimate school. 19 and 20 are again companion questions. What is the impact of technology on your students' learning? So what do you see as those outcomes? And then what do you see as those outcomes on your professional efficacy? Sometimes what happens is we focus a little bit too much on the student outcomes without understanding the importance of teacher effectiveness and how technology can drive teacher effectiveness. And then question 22 is that wish list, PD wish list question which for many, many schools and districts, that's their favorite question. But there's one other question, well, it's actually included in all three, but I wanna give a little bit greater emphasis on it. If again, and sometimes people ask me, I only wanna look at one question. All right, let me look at, let me point you to this bit of data, which I think can be highly actionable for you. And that's where we do ask all the different stakeholders groups across all the audiences, if you're designing a dream school for today's students, what tools hold the greatest potential to increase student achievement? It's a question that we have been asked, uh, we've been asking almost since the beginning of the survey. It's asked every year on the survey. It is an aspirational question. And again, as I said, it's asked across all the audiences. Now, the reason that that's important is that through this aspirational question, uh, as to where parents get to choose the types of digital tools that they think would have the greatest potential to increase student achievement. So the parents answer this, the students answer this, the teachers, the administrators, everyone answers this. You can see side by side how the different responses rank up against each other. So you can see if parents have a different perspective than teachers, if teachers have a different perspective than parents, where are our school principals in understanding this? So what I did is I pulled for you data from middle school students, school, middle school students, school principals, parents and teachers, and just chose, um, it looks like nine different digital tools. We pull on a few more. And just to be able to lay that data out side by side gives you great visibility into, do I have a shared vision for digital learning? Is everybody on the same page? Because the same percentage of parents, students, principals, and teachers chose these different types of technologies. Or do we see gaps? And why do we see gaps? Is it because we're not communicating effectively? Is it because we need to educate that stakeholder group a little bit more? Are they just not ready based on their own experiences? Remember, it goes back to those lenses that we have that we carry into this conversation. So we can look across here and we can see some areas where we see a lot of, of commonality. So for example, online textbooks looks like it's pretty uh, universal in terms of the acceptance around online textbooks, parents a little bit more held back than teachers, principals, and students. But that percentage point, percentage points is not overly significant. But take a look over on the right hand side at videos and games, because there we see a much bigger gap between the different audiences, in particular between parents and students. So um, when we poll on this, it's really interesting. Students are particularly interested, as you can imagine, 
in the inclusion of digital and online games, animations, simulations as part of their learning experience. They like that interactivity. They like the fact that through whether it's games and or videos, they have the opportunity to see things that maybe in a real world setting they couldn't see. Uh, teachers increasingly are interested in the use of video as well as game in the games in the classroom. But that parent number might be surprising to you. It might be surprisingly low. Now this is our national number and it might be different within your schools, within your districts. And here's the way we're interpreting this. And this is based on our focus groups that we do with parents. Parents don't necessarily understand the connection between videos or games in today's world and learning. They think about putting a video on from kind of an old school perspective that said, well, that was a lazy teacher that was putting the video on and the kids just sat there kind of passively watching a video. Now we know some of that still happens today, but the effective use of video, particularly to stimulate conversation, to bring the real world into the classroom, to think about it as a jumping off point for inquiry-based instruction and for students to debate different aspects of what was shared in the video is particularly rich. And I've seen some wonderful implementations of that. The same thing with game-based learning. But parents don't have that understanding. So that's where you see that possibly if I was looking at this, if this was my school or if this was my district, I would realize that before I implemented widespread use of video or widespread use of some of the very exciting game-based tools that are out there, some of that really cool adaptive learning technologies, I would want to cover the base of educating my parent community so that they were not put off by this. They didn't feel that this was not um, responsible usage of technology. I would want to be able to cover that base. And so the, here's where this type of a question, just even by itself, but looking across your different audiences, can give you all kinds of insights into where there is a universal shared vision or where there is need for additional work. Okay, so enough with that. Your turn or your homework, and we'd like to encourage you to use this methodology Take a look at your district goals, take a look at the data that can inform those goals, and walk through the process. Exercise the mus muscles of translating that data and creating those knowledge statements, and look for that action items that can come into it. Again, you're not going to take the whole huge set of data, but rather look at some particular pieces of it and start to see how that can inform your work going forward. Now, just a couple other ways that we can support your work, and then we're gonna take a look at where you might have some questions or some thoughts. Um, we have set up a, a, a large number of different types of ways for you to access the data. And, and my gut feel is you probably all have started accessing your data at this point. But then uh, Jenny has also, Jenny Hossard, our wonderful uh, Speak Up Operations Manager, has also set up a number of different templates to help you with downloads and even created for you a video so that you can start organizing your data thematically, which of course then could help you with that alignment to your goals. So this is all available on our website. And of course, there's the, the link to the YouTube video as well. In addition to that, and I think you probably all know this already, Jenny is always um, available to be able to help you if you get stuck on something or are not quite sure how to do something, she can help you with that as well. In addition to that, we have our national reports and our national infographics. Please take a look at those as well as we always put up the different presentations that we do around the country on the data. So you can also use that as a guide to understanding how to think through your data and what's most important. In addition to that, we do offer some additional consulting and workshop services on a contractual basis to be able to help you beyond all the support that we're already giving you. I mentioned a couple times that this was kind of a mini version. Today's seminar was a mini version of a three hour workshop that I do for school and district teams. We also can perform some additional analytics on your data. Uh, we actually just uh, heard from a school district today uh, that they want us to create this recommended list of actions from our analysis of their data, and we're happy to do that with them. 
We can also create infographics or reports for you on your data, as well as give you presentations on your own individual data. In addition to that, we have a couple other workshops that we offer, a really interesting one on messaging and metrics that gets directly to this too much screen time issue and also communications for effective leadership. So if any of these are of interest to you and you wanna know more about them, you can contact me directly. And of course, as you know, Speak Up is currently still open since we expanded the window of Speak Up for the full school year now. So for this year, uh, the surveys are actually still open till the end of June. So for some folks we're talking with, they uh, put a heavy focus on teachers maybe in the fall, but want to come back now and do parents in the spring or maybe do a different group of students that's still all available to you. So please take advantage of that if that's of interest to you. So with that, I'm going to take a pause here. I see a couple different things might be comments might be in our chat box. Um, but in addition to that, we could also open up our microphones and if anybody has a question or would like to uh, make a comment or a thought, um, I'm gonna take a sip of water since I've been talking kind of nonstop for a while and see what you have to say. So, um, some folks asked if uh, this was going to come as a session recording or just the PowerPoint, just to verify with everybody. I think Pilar already gave you that answer, but you're going to get both. Um, so you're going to get the actual session recording itself, and you're also going to get the PowerPoint. Again, it is around our intent to help you build up your capacity, your ability to use this data effectively. Of course, we're always here to support you, but I like the idea of building up your um, your experiences as well. All right, folks. Well, if no one has any other questions, and that's fine. Um, we're going to go ahead and say goodbye here at this point. I'm going to give you just a little bit more information before we totally say goodbye and give you the rest of your day back. I do want to let you know, of course, that this is probably a good time uh, to start planning for participation for Speak Up 2019-2020. Uh, since we now have the surveys open all year long, that means the surveys will open in August. And so starting to think about um, how you want to leverage uh, speak up from a data collection standpoint next year, how often you want to participate, what audiences you want to participate, what's your calendar for participation next year, probably a good thing to start thinking about here over the next couple of months. Also, just a reminder that we now have three different formats. We have the comprehensive multi-topic surveys, the ones that you're familiar with. Those are what we're now calling Speak Up 360. We have our snapshots, which are the shorter, more thematic surveys for specific audiences. And then what we call our flash indicators, which are quick in and out type polls around a very, very targeted topic. They tend to be just five questions, the snapshots 15, and of course the comprehensive ones are a little bit longer than that. So probably not a bad thing um, to start thinking about your planning for next year. And again, we can help with that as well. Um, before you know it, it'll be August. I know that that's a little scary for us because we have a lot of work to get ready for that. But uh, we're, as always, always looking for the opportunity to work deeply with you and better understand what your needs are. So with that, folks, thank you so very much for joining me today. It's been fun having you all here. Please let us know if you have any additional questions or if you think of something afterwards or if there's some other area that we can help you with. I look forward to doing that with you as well. So thanks so much, folks. It's been great being here with you.